feeling, you know, honorably like able to sell that crop. Only then is it fit for humans to consume. If it's not, if it's digestible for an insect or a bacterium or a fungi, it's not fit for humans to consume. I made that point earlier. Today. Where do slugs fall? Um, that's a good question. I would say they probably fit with the beetles. They're more sophisticated than the larvae. Um, this was the first year in a while I haven't had any slugs. That's been one of my most um, persistent pest pressures, disease pressures. It's been slugs. Yeah. Finally this year I had almost none. I'm not sure. Was it was drier? That might have had something to do with it, but there was plenty of time when it wasn't dry. Yeah. And I still have plenty of mulch in the ground. Yeah. No, I, I mean, there were a few this spring, and then they kind of just didn't go away. They, did, they didn't, didn't show up. We've had fairly serious slug pressure in the past. Yes? My experience with slugs is that until about 10 years ago, I would get slugs from the wet weather, and then I sprayed for three years, I made compost tea, yeah. aerobic compost tea, and at some point that completely disappeared. And then yeah. that barely came back. There's an occasional slug here or there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so these levels, does this also correlate with just plant age? So, you know, a plant would have to be to a certain level of maturity before they'd be able to no, really not necessarily. Grow. So it's just environment. <clears throat> uh, certainly the health of this, the, you know, the health of the mother and that quality of the seed is important, but you can get this from very, very early on. You can get high level function. All right, this is just sort of a conceptual framework. Um, it's in the handout for tomorrow as well, but um, this course is designed to be given uh, with like three or four months in between day one and day two. So um, oftentimes this point comes up and I just like to have it there in the handout. Um, so. Uh, Do you have a uh, real sea beetle problems at all, or? Mm, not really. Um, when I don't have enough water sometimes, I'll have that problem. Um, I have been able to uh, guarantee flea beetle pressure on my arugula by letting it dry out between planting and germination. Um, I've had you know, numerous situations where, for one reason or another, I planted my arugula and wasn't able to keep it moist between when I planted it and when it germinated, and I've had that, that planting will be just shredded. Um, and the next planting, the next week, because I know this was doomed, Right. I'll plant another batch, two or three beds right next to it, and stay on top of the watering, and these guys will be perfect. And these guys are full holes. Um, so I think and my experience has been that that early childhood stress, that, in, that really young germinating stress of drying out, is, right. is really hard on the plants and really weakens them yeah. and makes them more susceptible. Yeah. So are you pretty careful about when you transplant, like as far as like, summer heat? And I am pretty anal about the transplanting process, and I'm going to go into that for probably half an hour at least tomorrow morning. Um, um, make, getting a nice, really nice hole, um, I, it's like a three or four step process for me to make all my holes and get everything in there and get them all nice and wet before I put the things in. Um, I definitely don't do that rapidly. Um, it's a real serious job, and for me it's one of the last jobs of the year. Um, getting the plants in the ground, you know, put the drip tape down and getting the mulch down. Um, I don't have much to do in, in July um, when most farmers are getting real depressed and strung out, burned out. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, it's hot. I'm going to you guys. It's way too hot to be out in the field. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I'm a Leo. I'm a fire sign. Too much heat. Not good. <laughs> Uh, I get overheated quickly. <laughs> I don't like being out. I don't like being outside in the being down sun. So oh, yeah, no. I, it, yes, the transplanting process is really, really important, and I'm going to go into that in great detail tomorrow. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, fertigation, irrigation. Um, this is sort of this is um, just a. We'll talk more tomorrow about it, but the idea here is that uh, maintaining hydration is extremely important. I believe I conveyed that a couple of times this morning. Um, it, it bears repeating. Um, I think I said, if you cannot maintain hydration, don't waste your money on minerals. Um, if you have to prioritize limited resources, not that anybody here has limited resources, but if you have to prioritize limited resources, I think being able to maintain water in your soil is more important than taking the soil test and balancing the minerals. I mean, if you have to choose one or the other, I would say, you know, being able to keep your soil moist through the growing season is, is, is categorically important. So um, hopefully you can do both, 
or you already have the infrastructure in place. Um, but <clears throat> I think I went over it. I do use drip tape on my farm. I have three rows of drip tape in every four foot bed. Um, it's a passive, you know, I talked about this, I already, already laid it all out. It's a um, sump pump in, out of a little pond that I've dug myself into a syrup tank. It's a gravity fed passive system. It's really inexpensive. Um, I welcome anybody to come down and, yeah, and look at it and see. You, you saw that. You I didn't take the tour. Didn't I loved because oh, it was a long drive back. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very simple system, very inexpensive system. I feel pretty good about it. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't have that capacity, I would start uh, working on developing it, prioritizing it, uh, figuring out logistics, what you can do. Um, I personally prefer, you know, um, stream running fresh water to tap water, um, well water. I think water is uh, <clears throat> one of the most X factors um, that's way more sophisticated than we want to even begin to think about. Um, what other material, just as this is tangential, um, expands as it goes from a liquid to a solid? Anybody? No. Uh, wait. It's mercury. Like, why does ice float? Oh, yeah. Because it has it oxygen in it. Because, right, I mean, because it's, it, it gets bigger when it goes from a liquid to a solid. Like, because otherwise all the fish should be dead, you know I mean? <laughs> water is a really, really interesting, interesting material, and and it's not like all water. Water is not equal. You know, stagnant water, um, town water with chlorine, um, you know, water that's gone through long pipes and hoses. That's right. Um, all those things are great ways to kill the energy in water. Um, spring water is the best, supposedly. Yeah, spring water, yeah, stream water, something that's cool and flowing and... Curvy. Um, it's got this, this... If you look at water and how it runs on the landscape, um, it... You know, runs down a hill, it goes like this, right? In two dimensions, it looks like this. In three dimensions, I think it looks like this. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that's what the heart does, is it pumps the blood in this fashion. That's the only way, because it's putting spin into the blood, that it can go from the arteries through the capillaries and back out through the... I mean, you ever want to run that, that logistics on that one, the PSI? How much PSI would it take to pump a viscous material through this very long set of channels, it gets really, 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 really small. More than the heart can do. Way more than the heart does. The heart does not pump. The heart puts spin, as I understand it. But our water likes to flow in with this spin. Now, rainwater has an effect on crops that irrigation water doesn't seem to. I'm not sure anybody else here has noticed that or seen that or thinks maybe they've seen that. Um, you can irrigate all day long and the plants will stay alive, and then it rains, and then they grow, right? <laughs> you just gotta wait for the rain. <laughs> um, well, actually, there's a study that was done in China where they did just what you said, except they thanked the water, and they right. doubled their yield in one year, and yep. they asked people, how did you do that? And they said, we just bless the water as it comes down. And that's what the Masare Moto, Masare Moto, right. thing is all about, is that water holds consciousness you can magnetize it, you can vortex energize it, you can do all kinds of real interesting things with water. And that's totally exciting to me. And maybe we'll have time to go into it in more depth tomorrow. But in general, if you don't have water, um, you can be pretty much sure that you're not going to have a crop. So I'm um, a big fan of having the basic infrastructure to at least maintain hydration in periods of, of drought as a priority. So that's all I really want to say about that. Um, um, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Okay, kind of off, but you don't use any um, black plastic mulch? I do not. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I understand the rationale, I think, about weeds and stuff like that. Warming the soil. Warming the soil. And yeah. I have been really, really happy with my um, caterpillar tunnels. Um, people don't want caterpillars. They're basically like a really, really small loop house. They're, you know, in the middle they're six feet tall and they're about, well, seven feet tall, I guess, but 14 feet wide. Um, small little hoops, three, three beds wide, basically. Um, I've got a bunch of them on Craigslist um, over the past year and a half. Just old ones from a nursery that was closing down. I know where I can find anybody who wants some of those. They're like $12 a hoop. I would. Um, I, I can totally connect you to it. This guy had thousands of them. Thanks. There's a big old nursery down in um, 
Westport, Oregon. Um, but I got um, the equivalent of a 2,000 square foot hoop house. Um, uh, so it was 150 feet by 14. All the hoops and the plastic and the boards and everything for $1,000. Um, so 2,000 square foot hoop house for $1,000. Um, and you know, it's, the plastic was bought new and the hoops were bought used. Um, and you can do all kinds of really fun stuff with those. So I use a lot of plastic in the form of hoop houses, but I don't use black plastic. Um, and I got the, you know, the pole beans climbing up one side. You can do the salad greens in there in the wintertime, and then you can plant cucumbers and pole beans just inside the edge, you know, a month early or three weeks early, and they can start climbing up the poles and take the plastic off because it gets too hot in there by the end of April, <clears throat> beginning of May, or whenever, whenever it is exactly. And then it's basically you've got a structure for three-dimensional growing. You can do tomatoes in the middle and cucumbers over here and pole beans over here, cool. and then convert it back into salad greens. Um, I'm having great fun with my, my caterpillars. I think they, they really are totally value adds. Um, the you know, thousand dollars I picked in salad greens in the past couple of days on one Thursday was primarily out of, out of, out of those caterpillar tunnels. Um, I planted in middle of September and put the plastic on maybe three weeks ago. Um, um, just you know, pulled those tomatoes out and, and prepared the soil and put my salad greens in. Um, broadcast them right in there. So. Um, I think those are really good and would be really valuable up around here. Um, they, uh, uh, we had about 10 feet of snow last winter. Um, people may have heard about that in Massachusetts. And, you know, it was straight across the top. It was, the catapult tunnels were not visible. Um, and unlike a hoop house, which is 20, 25, 30 feet wide, where if it snows a lot, you've got to really <laughs> do some work to keep them from crashing down, the catapult was not big enough to, you know, get taken out by yeah. snow. So you can be really, really passive about maintenance and management in the winter time. Um, so. How wide did you say? They're 14 feet wide. They're basically one piece of um, you know metal pipe that's been bent right. um, into a hoop. And I'm not sure how long the hoop, it, how long the pipe was to begin with, um, but I bought them already bent because the guy had used them at a, at a, at a nursery. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, season extension is really, really exciting. You, you were talking about that, weren't you? Talking about season extension, you had a hoop house. No. Somebody was. Somebody I have a high tunnel for seasons. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got four, four high tunnels and four caterpillars to equal the grand total of about a half an acre of hoop house space wow. right now, and it's just awesome. I mean, it's just like <laughs> it's so nice. It's really I like my hoop houses. I've spent about ten thousand dollars, all told on the infrastructure for that half acre of hoop house space. It's all come off Craigslist. I haven't applied for any federal grants, haven't gotten anything, um, none of that none of that stuff. Just straight off of Craigslist, keeping an eye, um, going and picking them up and you know, disassembling them for people who didn't want What do you more. search for? Hoop house or hoop high house. tunnel, caterpillar tunnel? Um, hoop house pretty much, I think. Okay, good, I can do that. You can do that. Yeah, it's not hard. <laughs> and you find it when you call right up. <laughs> you get your truck and you go, I'll be there. <laughs> don't call, don't don't start looking until you got at least a couple grand, right? Okay. I mean, you can't, if you don't have the money to spend, then it's just a, you feel like horrible because there goes another hoop house. <laughs> oh, I could have gotten that one. <laughs> so you got to save up money for it first. Um, anyway, okay, uh, foliar spring. Uh, foliar spring. Oh, sorry. The last thing I want to say about irrigation was fertigation. Um, there's a couple things that I like to call cheating because um, it's not fair how much benefit you get um, to other farmers. Um, and one of those is fertigation, and one of those is foliar spring. So um, feeding your plants in season um, is it through the irrigation system or through a backpack sprayer. Um, I have found to be extremely powerful. Um, and if I ever want to make things look really nice or kick into a higher gear, that's all I really ever have to do. Um, at this point, I think you should not have to do that. You should not need to feed your plants in season. And I've gotten to a point where I don't do it very often at all these days because I don't really need to and I don't get around to it. But um, when I talk to people, uh, you know, backyard gardeners in many cases, uh, people who have like a couple thousand square feet um, who really want to do a good job with their family, and they say, you know, Money's not an object. Give me a protocol that I can do that will make my crops be amazing. And I say it's really simple. 
you do your mineral balancing, you, of course you do your you know, irrigation and mulching and all that kind of stuff, but you do a foliar spray once a week and you drench once a week. And you what? Once drench. Once? You put the, you, you, through the irrigation lines, you, you put a, a, you know, some kind of liquid mix of minerals. In my case, it's basically a mix of you know, finely ground rock dusts, maybe some trace elements, some seawater, um, maybe a little bit of kelp, um, but it's, um, sometimes there's some inoculants and the foliar sprays. Uh, we'll go into that in more depth tomorrow um, okay. because that's the that section of the of the course. But um, my basic mineral, you know, mix. Um, there's a little bit of molasses in there, uh, goodies on a regular basis. Feeding your plants. Um, I'm not talking about a lot. You know, you can talk about like a half a gallon of concentrate per acre, or a quart of concentrate per acre. Um, and and yeah, the the, re the response of the plant as it begins to kick into gear and then operate that higher gear and just keep going through the year at a higher and higher gear. Um, it's really quite quite impressive. Um, so, for the foliar spraying, the reason I've got that on this this half of the agenda is that if you don't have the capacity to apply a foliar spray, um, you know, I like to say Christmas is coming, and um, if you're looking for something to ask for, um, a nice backpack sprayer might be um, something to, to consider. Um, <clears throat> I personally am not a big a fan of the solo, uh, you know, classic pump action backpack sprayer sprayers. I find them to be um, I just have, I don't like them. I, I mean, we had too many bad experiences with them. I don't know what it was. Um, my elbows end up like hurting and they get clogged all the time and then they drip all over you and it's just like, you know, it's just like, it's like, <laughs> it just takes forever. I'm like, come on. So, That's the one I had. What's that? That's the one I, I had. Know, I know, I know. <laughs> My elbow does if it works for work. you, yeah, that's fine. No. For me, I'm like it just pisses me off, and so I don't use it. So. What do you recommend? Um, what I have now is called a mist blower, which is basically a leaf blower with a tank on top. Oh wow! So I can do this. You know, I can do the kitchen. I can get those dishes back there with no problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a game I play with my son when I'm fully spraying, where he has to sneak up and tag me before I notice him, and if I catch him, I get to turn around and blast him, and it's just like totally fun. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, leaf blower is, um, you can buy the mist blowers and they're hundreds of dollars, or you can get your hands on an old leaf blower and stick a tank on top of it, and all you need is like a little tube that runs the liquid down, and it just drops it into the end of the the you know, leaf blower, where the, where the air is coming out, oh. all it's doing is dropping the water into the air that's blowing fast, and it turns it into mist. It's like a, it's like a fog. Basically, you stand there and there's this fog that's coming out. Um, and you, it's really easy. You can do a half an acre in you know, 15 minutes. Um, you know, and the only problem is you have to stop and fill the... It took a long time because you had to fill the tank again. Right? And that's 15... I mean, those pump action sprayers take a lot longer. Um, they do. They're real pain in the butt as far as I'm concerned. So the only problem, the only downside of this blower is that it is a machine. Um, it's like you having a chainsaw on your back, right? It's loud, right. so you have to have headphones. Yeah. And it's just, I like to do my foliar spraying around dusk and having that kind of noise pollution at dusk is great on me. That part doesn't feel nice. But other than that, the logistics of being able to apply foliar spray um, rapidly over a significant area um, with little effort is, is, is well worth the, the hassle of getting the machine from my perspective. So, um, yeah, whether you are not interested in that or not, um, having the capacity to apply foliar sprays, I think a really valuable tool in your farming toolbox if it's not there already. What's the line between fertilizing and you know, decreasing your, your plant's capability and fertilizing Remember way earlier? Yeah. Well, so I was talking a lot about soluble nutrients um, more than um, so. It's I mean it's it's a it's a totally great. It's, it's a still soluble, right? I mean it's all water based. And you're I'm not spraying anything that's water based. Um, I mean maybe the seawater is water based. I'm but sorry, but it's dissolved. It's dissolved into the water. Micronized was the term I used, which means very 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 finely ground. So you take rock phosphate, and you take limestone, you take green sand, you take all these things and you basically bash them into really, really small pieces so that um, they have lots of surface area and they'll stand in suspension. And then you take that concentrate and you put it into water 
and you spray it out over the over the land. So um, certainly, uh, some things like the seawater, like the maybe the trace elements, the copper and the zinc are going to be in, you know soluble in principle. Um, and I always have a carbon source like humates or molasses or something like that to buffer them. So you, there, there's nothing that's soluble in the in the foliar spray. Um, I'm not doing it as an NPK kind of thing. I'm doing it as a prophylactic. I want to make sure you're getting all your multivitamins um, and your vitamin C and your, um, you know, um, positive oil. So it feels like that to me. It's more of a it's more of a prophylactic um, multivitamin. Um, if you have all systems generally functioning well, oftentimes you're going to have a limitation like not enough cobalt or not enough chromium or not enough, you know. Something like that is is what's actually holding back systems from going to the next level, and so if you can apply those on a regular basis in very very small quantities, we're not talking about much at all. Um, it's it's just um, anybody here applied foliar sprays and seen things happen that violated their understandings of physics? Uh -huh. yeah. Like what? I just put a little bit of concentrate over this whole field, and now all the plants are six inches bigger with new leaves and flowers. Like, what the hell just went down? That couldn't have happened. How could that small amount of material have such a significant effect? Um, I've seen that happen so many times, and I've talked to so many people who've had that experience. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I still am struggling for a proper explanation of how exactly, what is, the, what is the process by which foliar sprays work so well? But when they work, when you get what it is the plant needs into foliar spray, you know, next day, two days later, you get some just amazing responses. So. Um, it's a nice tool to have in the toolbox. A lot of people generally use uh, fish and kelp. I think those are the, sort of the traditional organic, you know, things, and sometimes maybe some compost tea. Um, I think you can basically have a much broader spectrum of ingredients. Um, not saying bad things about fish or kelp. I think they're nice, nice things, um, but just broadening the spectrum um, of ingredients is. Uh, <coughs> could Are you going to get into the rest of these tomorrow? That's all tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. All I'm saying today is get your hands on. A sprayer if you don't have one, or I strongly suggest. <clears throat> All right. Is there a question over here? Yes. Uh, yeah. So the plants can actually use minerals that you spray on their leaves that are not soluble? No. Um, there is a full suite of life on the leaves of the plant. Right. Um, and my understanding is that they are digesting those minerals. Okay and turn them into a protoplasmic form and feeding them into the plant. The plant is not just making sugar and injecting it into the soil, the plant is also making sugar and injecting it through the leaf onto the surface to feed this leaf life. Okay. Um, and that's the whole other level of system function, digestive system function, um, you know, resistance, disease, resistance, you know, they're the ones who are fighting the fungal infestations most vigorously are the people living on the leaf surface. So there's a whole there's a whole ecosystem going on there, um, and you're basically uh, feeding that ecosystem, which is right there with the leaf. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so. did, do you actually grind minerals up yourself? Absolutely not. No. no. <laughs> you buy. You buy. I've got a couple there. friends who makes some pretty high test <laughs> mixes, okay. um, which I've gotten into the depots at below market rates. Right. I'm like, here's what it costs for people, and here's what it costs for BFA members. Wow. It's legally, technically below market. Like, you can't get it for this cheap. Um, high end. Anybody know Jerry Bernetti? Jerry Bernetti? Mm -hmm. Jerry Bernetti. Um, his, his stuff, basically. He's got a full suite of products that he's made for feeding plants. It's really, really just intelligent. And, and do you mail it, or do we come and pick it up from you? It's incumbent on your chapter to coordinate your order and deal with logistics. So if you're talking about a track and trailer load of one ton totes, um, we can run it up to you, you can send a truck down. Mm. Um, you know, uh, we've got a depot and um, you're welcome to come down and pick stuff up. Um, so it just depends on logistics. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if it's a small order, like just for us, you know, for our place to start with. Yeah. Then we can drop um, down. What's that? Then we could just drive down. You can just drive down. We yeah. can put it in the mail. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're basically just getting it up and running. So it's. I mean, this is our. We'll figure it out by doing it. And um, <laughs> that's where we're. Next at. year we'll know more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if the, the facade has been created of a functioning organization, but. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> <so>. Don't. <laughs> the facade is the word. <laughs> no, it's, it's functioning. It's just, I mean, we're, it's, 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 you know, at the ground level. Um, Take so. it till you make it. What's that? Fake it till you make it. We're faking it till we make it. Yeah, we seem to be making it, but um, okay. So last slide is homework, um, and again, like I said, this this PowerPoint is designed to be applied, um, presented four months before tomorrow. Um, so this is your homework between now and tomorrow, um, over the winter, uh, to build permanent beds, um, or at least establish a system where you can minimize tillage in the future. Whatever that, um, you know, if you can get that done in the fall, that's really really nice. So you can do minimal tillage in the spring. Um, uh, apply your minerals. Um, it's too late for cover crops, obviously. I would say if you can get your minerals down and you can get mulch onto areas where you can see soil, that would be really good systemic steps for this fall. Those would be two really valuable steps. Cool. And um, that could be leaves, like you said, right? Leaves, straw, hay, um, you know, kelp is probably a little bit of a long drive. I was in Kennedy yesterday and this guy said, I can get you a triaxle of kelp for free. I'm like, oh, you get me a triaxle of kelp for free? <laughs> yes, sir, I'll take one. Um, so, yeah, um, I usually make do with hay. Um, uh, get your hands on the inoculants. Uh, source the best seed you can. Work on improving your potting soil. Um, get your fertigation and foliar infrastructure in place and read, read, read. I will leave these books out um, um, <clears throat> for those who are looking for things to do in a long, cold, Dark winter, um, you know, curling up with some interesting books and sometimes helps keep the creative juices flowing. Um, so I, I think there's a nice, nice selection here of things to uh, to put your appetite. And of course, many others out there. So I'm guessing it's kind of close to 4:30. Does anybody have the time? It is 4:30. Okay, perfect. Well, um, <laughs> we're done. Great job. Have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> 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 <laughs>